Good evening and welcome. I'm Marilee McFarland, Senior Director of Principia Alumni and Field Relations. Welcome to the encore presentation of The Earth is the Lord's Biblical Perspectives on Intersectional Sustainability with Dr. Barry Huff. This special talk was given as part of the Principia College International Perspectives Conference in October. Before we begin this evening, here are a few events coming up to mark your calendars for. Following the Thanksgiving weekend, join Dr. John Glenn for a trip down the Mississippi River on Monday, November 28th at 7 o'clock p.m. In advance of the Principia Lifelong Learning Trip, Charms of the South, former college history professor Dr. John Glenn will talk about the Mississippi River and share some of the monographs he has been examining especially Mark Twain's 1883 memoir, Life on the Mississippi. On Tuesday, November 29th, join Principians across the globe on hashtag Giving Tuesday to celebrate all that makes Principia extraordinary. During this season of gratitude, a gift from you will help to enhance our facilities, support our outstanding fat faculty, and sustain multiple opportunities for students to grow and learn. Finally, get ready to jingle and mingle with Principia all December long at our local Principia Club Christmas Sings and virtual Christmas events. We can't wait to celebrate the holiday season with you. You can find out the details for all of these events at principia.edu slash events. Now we take you to Principia College to hear Dr. Barry Huff. Good morning. My name is Laura Mayo, and I am this year's International Perspectives Conference Operations Manager. Thank you all for attending our Faith in Action. For 20 years, Principia College has held a student-run conference aimed at introducing its students to a wide range of international perspectives. Formerly known as the Pan-African Conference, in 2014, students of Principia expanded the conference to incorporate multiple perspectives from around the world, and the name was changed to the International Perspectives Conference. We hope that the broader understanding gained at this ninth International Perspectives Conference will heighten social awareness of global issues and initiate change. IPC serves four key goals. They are to educate others to become global citizens, embrace different perspectives and approaches, celebrate diversity, and unif unify humanity. This year, the IPC Executive Board has chosen intersectional sustainability as our theme. By using the term intersectional, we are seeking to help students understand the triple bottom line concept and realize that sustainability pertains not only to the planet, but also to people and prosperity. Dr. Barry Huff's talk today is named, The Earth is the Lord's. Biblical Perspectives on Intersectional Sustainability. Dr. Barry R. Huff is a professor in the Religious Studies and Philosophy Department at Principia College, where he has taught courses on the Bible and the environment and has twice been chosen as Principia College's Teacher of the Year. He has presented papers to eight sections at Society of Biblical Literature meetings including the ecological hermeneutic section. His published articles include an article on ecological interpretation of the book of Job in the animals issue of interpretation, a journal of Bible and theology. Huff and Patricia Vesley edited Seeking Wisdom's Depths and Torah's Heights, Essays in Honor of Samuel E. Ballantyne. Huff previously served on the Joint Action and Advocacy for Justice and Peace Convening Table of the National, National Council of Churches and as the Director of Principia College's Israel, Palestine, and Jordan Study Abroad Program. He recently completed a fellowship with the New England Regional 
Fellowship Consortium conducting research at the Congressional Library and Archives, Harvard Divinity School Library, Mary Baker Eddy Library, Massachusetts Historical Society, and New Hampshire Historical Society on Mary Baker Eddy and Biblical Interpretation in 19th Century New England, which are contributing to his current writing and upcoming courses. Please join me in welcoming Barry Huff. Thank you very much, Laura, for that gracious introduction, and to you and the IPC board, especially Gloria, and also faculty advisor Sally Steindorf for the incredible work to prepare for this conference. And thanks to each of you for being here today and for those who are joining us online as well. This concept of the triple bottom line, which we received a master class on last night from Sue Stevenson from Barefoot College in her superb talk, is one that we'll look at today through the lens of Bible scholars from around the world. And most of the talk will focus on biblical perspectives on this topic. And we'll close with this, some examples from the life and writings of Mary Baker Eddy, the founder of Christian Science, since this college was founded to serve the cause of Christian Science. I'll begin by sharing the perspective of several faith leaders on this concept of intersectional sustainability, on the intersection of economic, environmental, and social concerns as we work to find truly sustainable solutions. Pope Francis, who is from Argentina and is the first pope from the Southern Hemisphere, proclaimed in his encyclical letter on care for our common home that the biblical stories, quote, bear witness to a conviction which we today share, that everything is interconnected, and that genuine care for our own lives and our relationships with nature is inseparable from fraternity, justice, and faithfulness to others. The deterioration of the environment and of society affects the most vulnerable people on the planet. Then Pope Francis quotes from a pastoral letter on the environment and human development in Bolivia from the Bolivian Bishops' Conference, declaring the gravest effects of all attacks on the environment are suffered by the poorest. Pope Francis reflects, we have to realize that a true ecological approach always becomes a social approach. It must integrate questions of justice in debates on the environment, so as to hear both the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. The warming caused by huge consumption on the part of some rich countries has huge repercussions on especially Africa, where a rise in temperature, together with drought, has proved devastating for farming. I'd also like to share the perspective of South African Nobel Peace Prize laureate and Anglican Archbishop Emeritus Desmond Tutu. He wrote the foreword to the Green Bible which is a wonderful resource. You may have heard of Bibles that put the words of Jesus in red. What the Green Bible does is it puts words related to care for the environment in green. And if you're interested in a copy, please see me and I'm happy to lend one out. In his foreword to the Green Bible, Archbishop Tutu writes, we're made to live in a delicate network of interdependence. We are created to be members of one family, God's family. We must act now and wake up to our moral obligations. The poor and vulnerable are members of God's family and are the most severely affected by droughts, high temperatures, the flooding of coastal cities, and more severe and unpredictable weather events resulting from climate change. We who should have been responsible stewards preserving our vulnerable, fragile planet home have been wantonly wasteful 
through our reckless consumerism, devouring irreplaceable natural resources. We need to be accountable to God's family. After God created birds, fish, and animals, he created humans to be his viceroys and to act compassionately and gently toward all forms of life. The future of our fragile, beautiful planet home is in our hands. As God's family, we are stewards of God's creation. We can be wantonly irresponsible, or we can be caring and compassionate. God says, I have set before you life and death. Choose life. I'd like to invite you to look at several examples from the Torah of legislation related to the Sabbath and to look for these examples for instances you see of the triple bottom line of social, environmental, and economic concerns being brought together in dialogue. Please take a minute to read these passages from Exodus 23, verses 9 through 12, and Leviticus 25. And once you've done so, I'd invite you to share with a neighbor near you what examples you see in these passages of the triple bottom line of people, planet, and prosperity all being addressed. And if you're joining us via the internet, you're welcome to journal or reflect on this concept. So please go ahead and feel free to share with someone near you what examples you see in this Sabbath legislation of the triple bottom line. Thank you. Hi. Um, I definitely, uh, there's so much in there, but um, the first thing that I picked out was the land shall not be sold in perpetuity for the land is mine. That's a completely different way of looking at economics of property ownership and like the way that we treat the land um you know it's not like what happens next year and the next year it's what happens 100 years from now you know powerfully yeah. said thank you how would it transform our actions and our care for the planet if we saw where we lived not as our property but as god's and the Sabbath legislation is grounded in that conviction. Any other examples stand out to you? Sally. Well, I just love the parallelism of, you know, on the seventh day, we as humans shall rest, and also in the seventh year, the land shall rest, and just that, um, I guess it's not exactly connected to economic, but the land resting, you know, is connected to environmental and, um, you know, us resting has to do with our mental health and social concerns. Mm -hmm. um, so kind of interpreted in, in that way. But I guess it could tie back to economics as well. I mean, you're not going to have as much of a yield if you're, you know, planting and planting and not letting, you know, different nutrients come back in the soil. So it could have an economic repercussion as well. Excellent. Thank you, Sally. And Karen had an insight. Well, in the conversation that we were having, we noticed that not only what Sally just mentioned, that you leave the land not to harvest that year, but to leave it free for the community and to 
um, recognize that the that the poor will be fed perhaps outside of the economic system, not to purchase it, but just to have it available. And then in that last line, if your kin fall into difficulty and become dependent on you, you shall support them. And that was really clear as um, our care uh, and love for, for our brothers and sisters. And so that integration, I think, between all of our comments um, really gives a clear picture of how important that sort of systems view is and not trying to separate everything out. Outstanding. Thank you, Karen. When we look at the different versions of the Sabbath commandment in the Torah, the Exodus 20 version that is most popular grounds our Sabbath rest on God resting in creation. Another version in the Torah, though, grounds Sabbath on Exodus, on our emergence from slavery in Egypt and calling us to express the values of the God of Exodus, the God of liberation and justice, and how we care for and treat others, including humans and non-human animals, and the land. We're going to turn now to Genesis 1, because misinterpretation of this text is often to blame for mistreatment of the environment. What stands out to you about the parallels in verses 21 through 22 in the first bullet point and verse 28 in the second bullet point in their blessings? And what might be the implications of these parallel blessings between marine life, birds, and humans when it comes to sustainable solutions? What parallels do you see? Well, number one, I know there are several sustainability majors in the audience, so expect to hear from you guys. Um, but the the different, the similarities here, which I think are so heartwarming, is that God blessed all life, mm -hmm. you know, not just humans to sort of exploit and take from the lower forms, so to speak, but that God blessed everything and expected all of us, life, capital L, all equal in his reflection of, of life to be fertile and to multiply and to fill the earth. And it wasn't just our own purview to have that privilege. Thank you. And we're not even the first to receive this blessing. And we must live this blessing in a way that also allows the marine life and birds and other flora and fauna to be fertile and multiply and fill the earth. When thinking about what it means to image the God depicted in Genesis 1. This is a God who has such wonder and awe and celebration of each life form, viewing it as good, and then when creation is complete in its interconnected interdependence, the proclamation, it is very good. I saw a bumper sticker once that said, when you were created, God said yes. <laughs> what might it mean to live with that sense of awe and wonder, to say yes about each planet. Excuse me, yeah, planet. We'll think broadly about also each ecosystem, each plant, each animal that we encounter as something that elicits a divine yes. What does it mean to image this God who values the interdependence of all creation? Imaging this God means seeing dominion not as a justification to dominate or exploit the environment, but instead, as Ken Stone has described, as a call to radical environmental stewardship. 
Reverend Dr. Amadi Ahiamadu, who is the senior lecturer in the Department of Religious and Cultural Studies at the University of Port Harcourt in Nigeria, writes in his essay, A Critical Assessment of the Creation Mandate in Genesis 1, 26 through 28, and its human rights implications for Nigeria. This passage has been given such an interpretation as to encourage Western explorers, entrepreneurs, and investors to engage in economic activities, especially in a global quest for energy sources, which has resulted in grabbing more and more land, ecological destruction, environmental pollution, land degradation, deforestation, desertification, and impoverishment, especially in oil mining within the Niger Delta. Some have misread Genesis 1, 26 through 28 as portraying humanity in superlative terms and as pointing to human beings as the crown of creation. Then Ahi Amadu reflects, there is a conception in Africa of humans in partnership with nature, which contrasts with the mentality of humans above nature, with the latter's implication that nature must be dominated, devastated, and destroyed to advance the human course. Due to misreadings of biblical imperatives in regard to subduing the earth, humans have tended to misuse that dominion. It does not, however, diminish the fact that in most parts of Africa, nature is considered sacred and worthy of responsible care and use, especially with respect to land owned. And when we step back from viewing the biblical text through a human-centered lens, we realize that the opening creation text does not have the creation of humans as its climax. Instead, it has the Sabbath as its grand finale and the recognition that in the interconnectedness of all creation, in the realization of our responsibility towards one another, there's the proclamation. It is very good. As we move into the Bible's next creation text, we see the purpose for humankind being given to serve and to care for the earth. And there's a pun going on in Hebrew, because when it says that the Lord God formed the human from the topsoil of the fertile land, it's using the word Adam for human, not Adam, but Adam, which shares the same root with the word for land in Hebrew, Adama, showing our interconnectedness, our responsibility to care for the land and the earth. As Ellen Bernstein declares in her article, Creation Theology, a Jewish Perspective in the Green Bible, humanity's place then is to serve and observe the garden of the world. In fact, one might say that the first sin in the Bible is the overconsumption of a natural resource, the eating of the forbidden fruit. And we see that lesson continuing in the wilderness wanderings of the Hebrew people as they learn not to hoard manna, but to trust day by day that just enough supply will be given to meet the needs. As we move further in Genesis, we encounter the first covenant, which is given not to humans, but instead God's covenant with all creation, following the story of Noah and the ark, which Holmes Rolston III proclaimed as Noah and his ark is the first endangered species project. The covenant given following this story says, God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the clouds and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When the great Maya Angelou spoke at Principia College, she walked up to the podium and her first words were, when it looks like the sun, 
wasn't going to shine anymore. God put a rainbow in the cloud. Please join me. When it looks like the sun wasn't going to shine anymore, God put a rainbow in the cloud. I heard about five people that time. I want to hear everyone. <laughs> when it looks like the sun wasn't going to shine anymore, God put a rainbow in the cloud. Maya Angelou encouraged us to be a rainbow in someone else's cloud. And this covenant that God makes with all creation in Genesis 9 encourages us to live responsibly in such a way that we are rainbow in the cloud of earth as well. I'd like to share with you an insight from Wally Fajo, who is an indigenous Australian and elder of the Larikia Nation, in his essay in the Earth Story in Genesis titled, The Voice of the Earth, an indigenous reading of Genesis 9. He proclaims, the rainbow points to our responsibility to be partners with God, custodians of creation. That means reconnecting what is broken on earth. The covenant reflects God's concern for the earth, a deep respect for the earth as a subject of permanent worth. This covenant honors all life on the earth, not just human life. Through this covenant, a close interrelationship between humans and other living things, including the earth itself, is reaffirmed. God makes the same personal promise to kangaroos and crocodiles, to turtles and beetles, as to human beings. Humans belong with all life to the earth as a community. As interconnected members of the earth community, we have a responsibility to listen to the voices of others in the community. The Psalms broaden our concept of what it means to listen to other voices in this earth community and who actually has voice. Because in the closing Psalms, we see all life being envisioned as having a voice that it lifts in praise to God, broadening our sense of who is our neighbor to see the tree and the animal and the ecosystem as the neighbor who we are called to love. I invite you to join me in responsive reading of Psalm 148. If you'll read the portions in white, I'll read the portions in the pinkish color, and we'll read this call for all creation to praise God. Take it away. All of you bright stars, praise God. Praise the Lord from the earth. You sea monsters and all you ocean depths. Do the same, you mountains, every single hill. Fruit trees and every single cedar. Do the same, you animals, wild or tame. You creatures that creep along and you birds that fly. And the very final words of the book of Psalms are, let all that breathes praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You actually have been saying hallelujah a lot because in Hebrew, hallel is the word for praise. Yah is the shorthand for the Lord. So hallelujah is literally praise the Lord. Can I get a hallelujah? Hallelujah. Thank you. So the close of the Psalter calls us to live in such a way that all life can breathe, that all flora and fauna can praise God. And God's response to Job in chapters 38 to 41 of the book of Job described the entire earth as a sanctuary, the entire earth as God's temple or tabernacle, 
because terms that are used primarily for what is most holy in the temple, in the Torah, reappear in God's description of the cosmos to describe ecosystems, portraying all creation as sacred, encouraging us to treat all creation with the same sense of reverence that priests expressed toward God and to what is most holy in the temple. Job's journey through the wilderness, through the sea and their ecosystems and God's response to Job helps him see that the very ecosystems and species that were most maligned and disparaged in the ancient Near Eastern world, whether it be the wilderness, the sea, their inhabitants, animals that Leviticus 11 describes as unclean or an abomination, are portrayed in God's revelation to Job as the very apple of God's eye, as the very center of God's care, compassion, and concern, broadening his ecological and moral imagination, which he lives out in concrete ways in the conclusion of the book as he breaks the Torah by granting his daughters an inheritance along with his sons. The Torah in Numbers 27, 8 says that daughters can only have an inheritance if there are no sons. Job taking a lesson he learned from the environmental justice in God's response to him lives that out in intersectional sustainability by, through these social concerns, granting his daughters an inheritance as well, imaging the God who cares for all species and ecosystems. He treats his own daughters equally in his final act in the book. Okay. I'd like to invite you to read the final vision of the Bible, Revelation 22, and to share with someone sitting near you what this final vision in the Bible might teach us about living sustainably. Please take a minute to read it and then to share with someone near you. Please raise your hand if you're willing to share an insight about how the Bible's final vision might pertain to sustainability. Thank you, Arnold. I definitely love the fact that um, it's just show in the very deepest way the purity of God, where we have um, the bright crystal, and then we also have an idea of principle behind that. We have the 12 kind of fruit producing each fruit, uh, its fruit each month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. So I definitely love healing and how they portray the purity of God. Thank you. Thank you so much. And that message is profound because this text is being written during a time in which the city of Jerusalem and the temple lay in ruins due to its destruction at the hand of the Romans. And yet the author of this text envisions life-giving waters flowing from the throne of God, symbolizing the reign of God bringing a sense of restoration to the entire landscape. And at the time when it may, might feel overwhelming to think about how do we respond to a crisis like the climate crisis, or how do we find sustainable solutions in the face of all the environmental and economic and social problems in our world today, this vision written in the face of utter destruction and persecution of the restoration of not only the city of Jerusalem, but the entire landscape grounded in an understanding of the reign of God, even in the face of the most difficult of circumstances, I think can bring a sense of hope and healing, not just for oneself, but as the author of this text puts it, for the healing of the nations. I'd like to close by sharing some examples from the life and writings of Mary Baker Eddy. And earlier this week, during Principia's fall break, I was researching at the Mary Baker Eddy Library 
And this portion of the talk is largely based on my research there, including materials in their collection and the following articles on their website. What did Eddie say about weather and climate? Did Mary Baker Eddy care about the environment? And how did Mary Baker Eddy feel about animals? And I appreciate the helpful guidance from the Mary Baker Eddy Library Research and Reference Services staff and recommend checking out those articles if you're interested in more on this topic. I was struck to see that there are over 200 references to forms of the word sustain in the Mary Baker Eddy collection. Over 16,000 references in the Christian Science Periodicals and over 60 references in Mary Baker Eddy's published writings, including the opening sentence of the preface of Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures, where she declares, to those leaning on the sustaining infinite, today is big with blessings. What an extraordinary concept, the sustaining infinite. John G. Salkow's reminiscence gives a lens into sustainable practices on the working farm where Mary Baker Eddy lived at Pleasant View. Salkow writes, we had a large vegetable garden and raised all our own vegetables and also a good many apples and some smaller fruits. There was a good sized apple orchard. We used to gather 20 or more barrels of apples, which we would store in the cellar in the barn and then let the neighbors come in and pick the rest. Salkow notes that in spring 1901, they planted a field with rye that they only grew one year before using the field for pasture the remaining years, but they harvested enough rye in 1901 to meet their needs until they moved in January 1908. He also had an interesting reflection on Mary Baker Eddy's thoughtful embrace of technological advancements, noting that he understood Eddie's purpose in buying a car was simply to accustom her horses to it. And he reflects that she was very fond of her horses and saw to it that they had the best of care. The book Mary Baker Eddy, Christian Healer, Amplified Edition includes examples of Mary Baker Eddy's love for and healing of animals, including healing a bird's broken leg, a dead goldfish, and a horse who was limping. And in a 1906 letter to Sylvia Kennedy in the Bureau of Agriculture in Manila, Philippines, Eddy wrote, beloved student, you have my permission to heal the animals as well as mankind. When I were in practice, I healed them and found them responsive to truth in every instance. God gave man dominion over the beasts, and we have no authority for supposing that he ever recalled that gift or took away from man his rightful spiritual heritage. She's using the term man generically there to refer to all of us. And what a striking use of the word dominion. Envisioning dominion not as a justification to dominate, but instead as a call for us to care for and heal animals. And we could broaden that to say the environment. Mary Baker Eddy's substantial donations to numerous causes demonstrate her use of prosperity to bless primarily people, but also the planet. Here are some of the many examples from the Mary Baker Eddy Library's file titled Charitable Activities of Mary Baker Eddy. In addition to housing indigent students in her home at Lynn and providing hundreds, that's probably an understatement, one might be able to say thousands, of pairs of shoes to indigent children and adults in Concord, she donated to causes like the Massachusetts Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children, Homes for Orphans and the Aged, the Soldiers Aid Society, the International League of Press Clubs, the Concord Female Charitable Society, the Wellesley Student Aid Association, firemen's organizations, hospitals, schools, colleges, the Salvation Army, the YMCA, Macedonian Relief. We need another hour to get through this list. I'll share a couple more examples, though. The New England Women's Press Association, numerous Christian churches, including Christian Science, Congregational, Methodist, Second Advent, Swedish Baptist, and Unitarian churches. 
$500 to the Newton Hospital to help eliminate its deficit caused by giving care to the poor, $8,000 for paving roads in Concord, which helped provide jobs during a difficult economic time, and $5,000 to the New York Museum of Safety and Sanitation in appreciation for its having introduced safety devices to minimize accidents. She also gave substantially in response to disaster relief, including funds to people suffering from famine, to Dartmouth College and to the Shakers following fires, $1,000 to the relief fund for victims of the San Francisco earthquake. And up to this point, I've just been sharing the numbers as they were in her day. If we do an equivalent to what that $1,000 would be today, it would be over $30,000 and $500 to the victims of the 1908 earthquake at Messini, Sicily. Eddie's support of the growing global Christian science movement is exemplified by her $1,000 donations to Christian science churches in London, Hanover, Germany, and Scotland, which are recorded in a notebook kept by Calvin Fry. Eddie's international perspective extended beyond the Northern Hemisphere. She proclaimed in the First Church of Christ Scientist in Miscellany, from the interior of Africa to the utmost parts of the earth, the sick and the heavenly homesick or hungry hearts are calling on me for help, and I am helping them. In a 1907 interview published in the New York American, she stated, I know that my mission is for all the earth. Eddie's care for the planet is reflected in her letters to the Christian Science Board of Directors, requesting that they appoint a committee to pray about flooding, destructive lightning, earthquake, tornado, and cyclone, and to pray that, quote, he who reigns in the heavens and watches over the earth saves from all harm. Since we're running short on time, I'll simply encourage you to check out an example on pages 190 to 191 of volume two of We Knew Mary Baker Eddy, the expanded edition, for a wonderful example of Eddy's prayer resulting in a water um, filling a well of her neighbor and the neighbor's cows having the supply that they needed and the neighbor um, had expressed that concern the day before um, to her and her household, and that need was met. The intersection of people, planet, and prosperity shines through the following excerpts from Eddie's response to the Boston Globe's request for her comment on what the last Thanksgiving day of the 19th century should signify to all mankind. She wrote, it signifies that the Christ spirit will cleanse the earth of human gore, that civilization, peace between nations, and the brotherhood of man should be established, and justice plead not vainly in behalf of the sacred rights of individuals, peoples, and nations, that the atmosphere of the human mind, when cleansed of self and permeated with divine love, will reflect this purified subjective state in clearer skies, less thunderbolts, tornadoes, and extremes of heat and cold, that agriculture, manufacture, commerce, and wealth should be governed by honesty, industry, and justice, reaching out to all classes and peoples. I'd encourage you to read Mary Baker Eddy's Exegesis of Genesis 1. The ecological vision expressed in that exegesis is profound. And I will leave you now with a prayer from Korean minister Sun I Lee Park to conclude our time together today. This is quoted from Introducing Asian Feminist Theology by Kwok Pui Lan. Sun I Lee Park prays, Oh, dear God, pour your spirit that burns in the bush, that sweeps away to bring newness, like powerful surfs of ocean, like mighty wind 
blowing from and to all four corners of the world. Purify and sanctify. To make anew, to make whole. Amen. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Huff, for that inspiring talk. And thank you all for joining us this evening. We look forward to seeing you at our upcoming events the end of November and all throughout December. Our hearts are filled with gratitude for each one of you. On behalf of all of us at Principia, happy Thanksgiving.